Hi, welcome to Radiologist Headquarters. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and it's time for five cases in five minutes, vascular imaging number five. I'm going to show each unknown case slide for about 10 seconds, and you can pause to study the images further if you'd like. I'll then review the findings, reveal the diagnosis, and we'll move on to the next case. Ready? Let's go. Case one, history of trauma, CT angiogram of the chest. Slide two of two, sagittal and volume rendered reformats. Okay, so I gave you a vague but helpful history of trauma, and these images show an intermedial flap extending transversely across the aortic lumen here, focally. And there's also a small intramural hematoma at the posterior aortic wall here, as well as a small mediastinal hematoma. And also notice how there's a bulbous contour to the anterior aspect of the aorta here, which makes you concerned that there could be a pseudoaneurysm or a contained rupture. And the sagittal images show that much more nicely that, indeed, there is a pseudoaneurysm here at the site of this intermedial flap here. And you can also see that on the volume rendered reformatted images, the pseudoaneurysm outpouching here. And this is typical for a traumatic aortic injury with pseudoaneurysm development. So these injuries occur most commonly right here at the aortic isthmus, which is the part of the aorta just distal to the origin of the left subclavian artery. And it's the site of the ductus arteriosus, the ligamentum arteriosum. And that makes this site a bit more prone to shearing forces because it tethers the aorta. So if you have a sudden acceleration or deceleration like you might have with a MVA or a traumatic fall, that's when you're more likely to see these injuries. And it's important to detect this because it has a a very high risk of being a lethal injury. And usually the patients who survive to the emergency department usually have partial thickness tears of the aortic wall with this type of pseudoaneurysm formation. So typically if the injury occurs at the aortic root or ascending aorta in arch, that tends to require surgical repair. But injuries involving the isthmus, descending aorta, and abdominal aorta can sometimes be repaired with endovascular stent graft introduction, but it depends on the extent of the injury and the stability of the patient. Case two, non-contrast and angiogram CT images of the chest. Coronal, sagittal, and volume rendered reformatted images, slide two of two. Okay, so these left hand images show a small left pleural effusion as well as hyperdensity within the mediastinum, indicating a mediastinal hematoma. And as you look at the aorta, you see this rind of hyperdensity within the wall, indicating blood or hemorrhage within the aortic wall, typical for an intramural hematoma. And as you recall, intramural hematomas don't have an intimal tear, right? They're usually caused by ruptured vasor visorum that bleed into the wall of the aorta. But what do we see here? We do see this little wide mouth ulcer-like projection extending into the intramural hematoma on these contrast-enhanced images. And if we look more closely at that area on these coronal reformatted images, you do see this ulcer-like projection extending into the intramural hematoma filled with contrast. And we see that also here on the sagittal reformatted images and additionally on these volume rendered reformatted images protruding outside of the lumen. So this is an intramural hematoma with an ulcer-like projection. So what does that mean? So when you see an ulcer-like projection like this, it indicates that there is actually a small intimal tear or intimal injury with associated blood flow kind of protruding into the media. And you see this most commonly in the ascending area aorta and the aortic arch, like in this case. And it's an important finding to detect because there is a risk that this ulcer could enlarge and rupture, and it can also involve into a dissection or an aneurysm. So whenever you see an ulcer-like projection, it's usually an indicator for treatment of the intramural hematoma, even if that hematoma otherwise has non-aggressive features. Okay, case three, non-contrast and angiographic images descending thoracic aorta. Same series, a bit more inferior. Final slide, magnified image. So here we're looking at another intramural hematoma. Here on the contrast enhanced images, you can see that it looks like a rind of hypodensity that you could confuse with plaque, but it's very smooth. And also on the non-contrast images, it's hyperdense, indicating intramural hemorrhage. And this would be a type B hematoma since it's only involving the descending thoracic aorta. And as we scroll in fairly, you see that there's this little pooling of contrast within the hematoma. So is this another ulcer-like projection? Well, if we look more closely, if I zoom in here, you can see that it's actually not. It's something else known as an intramural hematoma with an intramural blood pool.
So how do you differentiate this from an ulcer-like projection and why do you care? <laughs> well, these actually have no poor prognosis. This is just kind of an incidental finding that often resolves over time. And the way you can differentiate it is that these tend to be a bit smaller, usually less than five millimeters in size than an ulcer-like projection. And the key is they'll have this communication with a little branch vessel. So it's almost like a type two endoleak, right? That's feeding, this little artery is feeding this intramural blood pool, something you will not see with an ulcer-like projection. Also, you don't really have a communication with the lumen. Remember, the ulcer-like projection has a wide communication with the lumen. In this case, you do see this little pinpoint tiny orifice, which you could sometimes see, but usually that won't be any wider than the actual feeding artery that's going to this intramural blood pool. And again, these tend to just resolve over time. So these have no poor prognosis. It's just an incidental finding, but you don't want to confuse them with ulcer-like projection. All right, case four. These are images of the mid-abdomen with contrast CT. Slide two of two with bone windows. Okay, so we're looking at multiple images of an IVC filter, and here it is right here in the IVC. And as we move inferiorly, notice that the struts extend beyond the lumen of the IVC. Here you can see these two struts are surrounded by retroperitoneal fat. So this is an example of IVC filter perforation. And here on the bone windows, you can actually see that one of these struts, the posterior most strut, is partially embedded in the cortex of the vertebral body here. So Dr. O did a study describing the grading system for IVC filter interaction with the IVC wall and proposed this system. So grade zero is normal when the struts are entirely in the IVC. Grade one is when there is a strut immediately adjacent to the external aspect of the IVC wall. So that's when you have the struts tenting the wall. Grade two is when the strut is entirely outside the IVC lumen and it's surrounded by retroperitoneal fat. And then grade three is when the strut touches or perforates organs outside of the IVC. So that could be liver, bowel, aorta, lymph nodes, psoas muscle, or vertebral body like in this case. So in that study, they found that it was not uncommon to see some degree of IVC filter tenting or perforation relative to the IVC wall, and that these filters could still be removed safely. However, it's important to mention if you see IVC filter perforation extending into an organ because that may cause some difficulty in the IVC filter removal. So in this case, this limb was partially embedded in the cortex of the vertebral body, and it was a little difficult to remove, but it was still successfully removed from the patient. Okay, last case, history of aortic endograph repair. These are CT angiographic images. Slide two of two, sagittal reformatted images, and I should tell you this was an ovation endograft. Okay, so this case is a little tricky, but here we're looking at axial images on the left-hand side, and you can see that there's a large abdominal aortic aneurysm here, inferenal, and then there are the iliac limbs of the stent graft, and you don't see any endoleak at this level, right? You just see non-opacified aneurysm sac. But at the superior aspect of the endograft, you do see this contrast pooling anteriorly. So whenever you see contrast at the superior aspect of an endograft, you will worry about a type 1A endoleak. And here on this coronally formatted image, we get a sense that there may be an endoleak there superiorly at the superior margin of the abdominal aortic aneurysm sac. Again, there are those two iliac limbs. So here when we look sagittally, you do indeed see this contrast here superiorly, entering into the excluded aneurysm sac, and that indicates a type 1a endoleak. So the reason this one is tricky is because it's an ovation stent graft, which these types of grafts are a little different. They have this long suprarenal stent, which is actually not responsible for sealing. That's there more for fixation. So this part of the stent is uncovered. So the real top of the stent is right here, where you have these two polymer-filled O-rings. See these little hyperdensities here extending on either side of the graft? So these kind of encircle the top of the graft, and this is actually the top of the sealing part of the graft here. So the fact that you have a leak here indicates that it is indeed a type 1A endoleak. So I've already gone over this a few times, so I won't beat a dead horse, but just remember that the type 1 endoleak is when you have seal failure between the aorta and the graft ends, and that's most common after a thoracic aortic aneurysm repair, but of course we still see it in the abdominal aortic region. So again, type 1A is if it's proximal, above, and type 1B is if it's distal or below. And actually with ovation in a graft, sometimes you do see a type 1A endoleak that can spontaneously resolve, but in this case, this was a prominent endoleak and the sac was increasing in size, so it was repaired by placing an aortic cuff here in the proximal portion of the aortic stent graft. So you can see that the type 1A endoleak has resolved on these post-repair images. Hey, that is it for five cases in five minutes vascular imaging number five. I really hope that you enjoyed this lecture, and if so, please subscribe to Radiologist Headquarters on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. It would be miraculous if you shared these lectures with even just one person or left a podcast review. You can also leave a comment or a question on YouTube, and I'll do my best to answer it. 
Visit us at radiologisthq.com for more info and to follow us on social media to get updates. Thanks and have a great day. Thank you.